Marcia Norman. This morning I'm going to be interviewing Mary Rogers, one of the great legends of the American theater. She was out there way ahead of women writing in the theater. She's probably best known, depending on how old you are, as either the daughter of Richard Rogers or the author of The Great Freaky Friday and Once Upon a Mattress. Mary has five children and husband and social life and friends and charitable organizations and you know she has an actual life that it would take two or three people to live. She somehow managed to live that life and at the same time do this work. She has continued to help and do good and support the American theater. I think from the minute she wakes up she probably I don't know, just, she probably doesn't even think about what good am I gonna do today. She just goes ahead and does it. Hey, Hello. Hey. Hello. Hello. How are you? Oh, I'm so happy to see you. Yes. You too. You picked the coldest day in the world. It's oh. awful out there. Don't go. Don't go no. out. I won't. <laughs> Oh, um, no, I no. this room is so beautiful. It's wild, isn't it? It wild is. Prince. No, it's the best. Here's our best thing. This is Adam Gettle's Tony. These are all for you, however. Not all. I just grab whatever he has because it looks good. It does look good. Very glistening and gorgeous. This, there's a Christopher. I got a Christopher for Freaky Friday. This was given to my father, and that was given to me by Juilliard. And I don't know where I'm going next, so it's just as well as no room for it anyway. <laughs> Come <laughs> sit down. When you get there, there will be an even larger trivia. Yes, there will. Yes. Well, Mary, I am so happy to be here with you today. I know that the question that you were probably a most asked all the time is, you know, what was it like to be the daughter of Richard Rogers? You know, there's a, there was a fantasy aspect to, to being the daughter of a, of a great American composer and, uh, you know, in a kind of regal family. And so is that what it was like? Not <laughs> remotely. <laughs> uh, we lived in the apartment side of the Carlisle Hotel on 76th, and there was no money, everybody thought, you know, who knew me later, thought my family had a lot of money. Daddy didn't have a lot of money. Nevertheless, there was a cook and a waitress and a nanny. All I wanted was to get out of the house, which is why I let, I, the lack of freedom drove me crazy. Uh, I was a very rebellious kid and I would lie. I thought my parents didn't know what they were doing when I was about five years old. Yeah. I remember thinking, these guys don't know how to do this. <laughs> I, I'm gonna, when I get grown up, I'm gonna have children and I'm not gonna do it that way. And I think one of the most important aspects of parenthood is trying to help the kid locate its passions and its talents and then give them everything you can afford to give them to help them go on with that. Was it like, don't touch daddy's piano, or was it like, no, no go study? Was, music lessons were a given, but then I think probably you can tell fairly easily if children are remotely musical, which we both were. And then um, daddy would do wonderful stuff with me. I mean, not classy, he would do the chopsticks bass so that yeah. I could play the top. And one song that I particularly loved of his that required simply thirds, chromatic thirds, called Why Can't I? It was a Rogers and Hart song. And he would play the bottom and I would play the top. My father was not an easy guy to get along with. He didn't have any best friends. He had one very good friend. Uh, all he wanted to do in his entire life was write music. I think he was reasonably civil to my mother, in fact, very, uh, but she was handy. She was an excellent chatelaine. The house was great, it smelled good, the food was good. She was very pretty. She was everything you'd want in a wife in the 30s. But I don't think it was an easy marriage and it was not an easy parent either. I think he, 
his whole world came from deep inside somewhere. And he was aware of that deep inside and that he was actually going to show that deep inside to the world in the songs? And I'm sure he wasn't. I'm sure it never <clears throat> crossed his mind. That he was going to... He knew he wasn't happy. I know that because he went to several shrinks. And he also had a drinking problem, and I'm not revealing anything that people don't know by now. But I don't think he was a terribly nice man outside. But inside, I don't think it's possible to make the kinds of sounds he made without goodness in there somewhere. Right. And I don't remember his ever mentoring anybody with the possible exception of me when I would play things. And his mentoring consisted of sort of grunts, mm -hmm. wasn't terribly interested, until I played a song that I was writing for Once Upon a Mattress. Right. And he said, why did you do that in the bridge? I had changed tempo completely. And I said, I don't know, I liked it. And he said, I wouldn't have done that. And I thought, okay. And I never again played anything for him until the orchestra played it. Right. Because I thought people will either think, mm -hmm. as they frequently did, I think, that he was really writing my music because I was such an embarrassment, or whatever. But for sure, or you were writing for his approval, or you were yes. somehow you had someone looking over your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. And he was hurt by that. Mm -hmm. He understood it intellectually, but it hurt his feelings. He wanted to be part of the party. Can we go back to the moment that you wrote the first song, either in your head or on the paper? My first writing came from making mistakes at piano lessons. Oh, I would fantastic. play things that sounded wonderful to me, but they weren't what was written down. And uh, it interested me enough to be willing to write hymns at school, being a, a, yes. a non-believer. But I took work wherever I could get it, so I used to do that. I wrote uh, the race, the crew song for Wellesley. I mean, what could be more boring? I didn't even like Wellesley, <laughs> let alone care about writing a crew song. But if there was work, I did it. You can't do a few one, bars two, of it, can you? For what are we for? We are the forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you are a composer and you are a writer, and that's really rare for somebody to have those two qualities. Did you know both of those? No. Uh, in the first place, I went to a wonderful school that concentrated heavily on the English language. And my father loved language and would correct me. I mean, anybody who said somebody gave a lovely party for Marcia and I was practically banished from the house. Um, and I continue, I'm ashamed to say, to do that. I correct people's grammar all the time. Uh, that, that was from the school, from my father, and from my grandfather, who was a doctor, but he loved language, and he taught me how to diagram sentences, which everybody, when they got to it in the ninth grade, detested it, and I still thought it was a game. They're doing a lot of research now on the music instinct, but it's, it's as fundamental to animals and people, apparently, as eating and drinking are. Uh, that's very different from language. Uh, it's also, I believe, the reason that it's so much more fun to write music than it is to write lyrics. You really have to work to write lyrics. Steve Sondheim may love it, but <laughs> most other people think it's a royal pain. I used to say it was like having rats running around in your head. You'd rhyme things in the middle of the night and think, oh good, I've finally got it. You'd wake up in the morning and it was like being on pot. Didn't make any sense at all. Writing music, every sound you make makes you want to make the next sound. It's a sort of self-propelling experience that native tribes instinctively know. It's, it's an instinct. Would you talk a little about Mattress? You know, a lot of people don't know how you go from having no show to suddenly show. Well, it surprised me too. 
going from no show to a show. Um, I worked for about four years for Golden Records, Little Golden Records, and Marshall was the hired staff lyric writer for the Little Golden Records. And he asked me if I'd like to do lyrics for, for the company, and I said, yes, I'll do lyrics if you'll let me write the music to go with them. And he agreed to do that. And a, a few months later, Marshall said, have you ever heard of Tamamet? Well, Tamamet was a resort in the Poconos, mostly used by women who were hoping to find a guy and guys who were hoping to get laid. And they came for a week, and there were quite a few writers who lived in a barracks kind of thing, and we would put on a review every week. A different which, one, a new one. A, a new one. And uh, I was the only one with any children. I had three children by this time. That first year, uh, Marshall was told by the man who ran Tim, and he could do a musical if he had a good idea for one. And he'd had a good idea for a long time. It was The Princess and the Pea. So we wrote that whole thing in about three weeks. And he made me write, there's a song in it called Soft Shoes. I wrote Soft Shoes 11 times mm. until it suited him. And we couldn't find anybody who wanted to produce it until we got to New York when Gene and Bill Eckhart, the designers, and Nori Houghton and T. Hamilton, who were the producers and the owners of the Phoenix Theater, had some space in the summer. And that's how it happened. Then they thought, well, we'll see if we can get ourselves a director. So we auditioned it for George Abbott, who'd been an old friend of my parents, who did it, came down and listened to what there was of it to be polite, but he didn't really expect to like it very much. He did like it, and he said, well, let's see now, like if you can get it done by, I have May, if you get it done by May. And we had three weeks to write the whole show and write the songs. And I don't know how we did it, except that we worked day, literally day and night. We also had to do something sad, which was to go to Nancy Walker, who did not work that often then. She was older, but she was dying to do it, and she was all excited that, that it was really going to happen. And George Abbott, at our first production meeting, and everybody was in the room, said, um, how many people in this room want Nancy Walker oh to play the part? And everybody's hand shot up, except George's. And George said, well, I'll tell you, I'll do it. I'll do the show, because I told you I would do the show. But I won't enjoy it. I love Nancy Walker. I've worked with her. But Nancy's a star, and I don't want to work with a star. I'd like to make a star. So we started auditioning. We saw several people who were good, but nobody who was perfect. Judy Abbott, George's daughter, has now come up with another name. Somebody called Carol Burnett. So I yelled to Marshall down the hall, guess what, now we're supposed to look at somebody called Carol Burnett. He said, Carol Burnett is brilliant. She was at Tamament when I was there. We will call her right now and get her to come down here. In she came, and she was wildly attractive, much too attractive. Her skin was great. Her hair was this wonderful red. Her legs were perfect. And she had a voice you could hear in Toledo, Ohio. I mean, she was incredible. And we said, listen, we think you're going to be great for this. But you're actually too attractive. So what do you have in your closet that's truly disgusting? <laughs> and she said, well, almost everything is truly disgusting because I don't have any money, but I have a particularly unattractive suit. Would you like me to wear that? Fine. Out came Carol and got the part instantly. I've always been shy. I confess that I'm shy. Can't you guess that this confident air is a mask that I wear cause I'm shy. And we had a hard time coming up with a, the 11 o'clock number for her. And she said, oh, 
fellas, I'm just so grateful to have gotten this far. I'll be happy to just go home after this. And uh, shortly after that, we came up with the song that was finally acceptable to, to, uh, to George. So when, when Mattress, I mean, Mattress had an extraordinary life. I mean, still does, I'm happy to record. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Do you, are there moments in, and I don't want to limit it to just Mattress, but are there, are there moments in, in your own work that you really love? Adam, for my birthday, my 80th it birthday. It was a glorious occasion. Made a CD for yes. me of about seven songs that he particularly liked from all kinds of different venues and things. And when I listen to it, it's the first time I've ever experienced feeling a little sad and thinking, oh, why did I stop? I could have done more of this. But it, it wasn't practical. That, from the point of view of having five children, is, is the real reason that I went on and then wrote kids' books and movies when I got one until I found out it was so loathsome I didn't want any anymore. I had been working on a musical for three years that was clearly never going to come to pass. And I thought, I don't have time for this. Five children, one's a baby. Men writers don't get asked, how, how did you manage to have all that work and still live your life? I mean, they just don't get asked that question. They would say, what do you mean? Because it's perfectly clear that the wives are doing all of that. Right. I got a letter from Ursula Nordstrom, who really invented children's books. And she wrote me a letter and said, uh, I wrote your friend Steve Sondheim to ask him if he would be willing to write a children's book for us. And he said, thank you very much, no. But his friend Mary might. So it was right after I'd made up my mind that I had to find something else right. I loved doing when it, I got this letter from Ursula saying, come in and talk to us about naturally anybody, anything that sure. occurred to me yeah. about being bad was very appetizing. So the first book I wrote for them was called The Rotten Book. It was about a little boy who fantasized about all the rotten things he would do right. if he could. And then I was off in this whole new career. I don't think I'm the same personality creative personality as either my father or our son, Adam. Uh, I have many more things that have always interested me. And if one thing didn't succeed, I thought, oh, well, and went on to the next thing, which is something that women are still able to do quite easily and men can't do. They have to be top. They have to be best. There are so many availabilities for women that if something doesn't work, give up, go do something else. Well, uh, there are availabilities for women like you who have who have vast interests and an extraordinarily rich imagination. And Freaky Friday, I mean, you invented a whole genre, which is the we change places and then we try to get back. Um, and I'll tell you another little secret, which is I didn't invent that. Thorne Smith did, and you probably don't know who Thorne Smith is. He wrote a book called Turnabout that I read when I was in bed with a cold when I was a teenager. And it was about a girl, who, a, a husband and wife, who changed bodies. And the man was furious because he was a woman and pregnant, <laughs> which he did not envision for himself. And I remember thinking, that's really funny. So I can't take complete credit for it nor would I want to, because there are, there are very few ideas to write books out of. Do you like having no one around but you? And I mean, you know, no, no collaborators to talk with, no No, other... that, was, that was fine. I mean, you can't write a book with another person unless you've set out to do that. The only thing I needed was a little peace and quiet. So I used to write out schedules for Hank, my husband, to follow. You know, Monday he gets his hair washed, if you can find him. And I would go up to the Catskills, where we had a house then, and stay there for three weeks and work on a very tight schedule, which was just the way I chose to work. I discovered pretty soon that you really can't be creative with the language uh, 
for more than three or four hours. Exactly. exactly. But you can use the afternoon section and the evening section, plotting the next part or correcting the old part or whatever it was. And I would get the work done that way, and I worked fast. Because how long can you leave your husband? Making well, I was just going to say. I mean, did yeah. did your friends or did anyone say how can you go off and do this? How can you how can you? No, I'm sure they thought it, uh -huh. but uh, I don't remember anybody actually saying it. Right. So once the book world opened up, then then was that did that feel good? Did this feel like okay? I'll now I'll just do this. Yes, but then I got a call saying Disney wants to make a musical of Freaky Friday. And they've decided that it was a wonderful guy called Bill Walsh, who was the director for Mary Poppins. And he said, what are you looking for writers for? Why don't you get the woman who wrote the book? So I went out to Hollywood and was interviewed. And I'm sure they wondered. It was, it was like a freak with four legs. It, this married Jewish woman from New York was going to be working for them. They just didn't know what to make of it. And they did a lot of changes. I mean, I realized after five movies that I wrote and got paid for, that they might pay you more every time you did another one, and they did. But uh, they owned you. Exactly. And if you grow up in New York, they don't own you. This is Carol Burnett yes. and me ah. when we left the Phoenix Theater and had our year-long hegira <laughs> all around Broadway whenever we could find a house to play in, we moved to it. Oh, my goodness. We finally took an ad saying the most moving musical in town. <laughs> 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 Would you have a seat? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Comfy? I feel so happy here. I feel, yeah. I do. We I... have a guest room. You can stay. <laughs> okay. You have known some of the most wondrous people in the world of the theater. So we're the good guys of oh. the American theater. Certainly Steve, whom I met when I was 14, and he was 15, and I thought, this is going to be the smartest person I will ever meet. And I was absolutely right. We became really good friends when we were apprentices at the Westport Playhouse in 1950. And I remember thinking, what did I want to do in life? I had no idea till the summer of 1950. And then I thought, I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm going to find something in the theater. Because there was, there was nothing in the way I was brought up that would lead me in any inviting direction in the high school I went to. They didn't have Jews. I said, I'll go to an all-Jewish camp then. So I went to an all-Jewish camp, and I didn't understand them either. They were practically speaking a language I didn't understand. And I thought, where am I going to belong? I don't belong anywhere until I got to Westport. And I thought, I've got to find something. That summer, I was mostly on props and occasionally um, assistant stage manager. But most of it was horsing around and finding out how much fun the theater was. Yeah. I, I, that, that the theater does alert the people that belong there that this is home. I mean, mm. somehow or other, I mean, everybody can point to a moment, a, a, you know, a production, a, a, an instance in which they knew for sure that this was where they belonged. People that want to want to live fully in, in that same way need to know how to do that. I mean, what do you need in order to, to live that Mary Rogers get old life, that kind of iconic life? I was very lucky, Marcia, in that people, I got offered things. When, when Ursula Nordstrom asked me if I wanted to write a children's book, how often does that happen? Right. There are people all over the country desperately mailing in children's books, right. hoping that somebody will pick up on it. And I had a lot of help. Now, nobody was going to hire me to write music because I was Richard Rogers' daughter. But if it hadn't been any good, they wouldn't have taken me. Right. So um, that's, that's luck, the fact that you're born 
end of that, there were a lot of doors that were opened. Secondly, if you're married or living with a guy, it takes a very nice one. And I happen to have got one of those. And we will have been married 50 years in October. Among other things, he was enormously positive and helpful about whatever work I was doing, whether I was writing music, because he read music and played the piano better than I did, so I could get him to play the top while I was sounding out the bottom. So that's very lucky. You have to look for somebody like that. Um, of either sex, whoever wants to be helpful and that you love. Of course, he does not run a company. He doesn't own a company. He's not a billionaire, which leads me to why I wrote the second kid's book I wrote for middle-aged children called A Billion for Boris, because men grow up being somehow inculcated with the erroneous instruction that everybody has to be the best. Women don't feel, they don't have to feel that way. Now, when I finished that book, A Billion for Bars, I said to my editors, um, I bet you pretty soon women are going to start to feel this way, that they have to be the best. And she said, they're not going to, they already do. And that competitive thing never existed with us. He doesn't own a company or run a company or have millions of dollars. He knows how to make money and he knows how to get along with people, which a lot of people who make a lot of money don't know how to right. do. So that's very lucky. You have to look for somebody like that um, of either sex, whoever wants to be helpful and that you love. Um, what else? Let's talk about Juilliard. I know it from from my side, but but let me hear you talk about your. What, did, did someone call and say, "Come, Mary, come and run, come and be be on our board"? And well, how did that oh, go? Yeah. So Mary Ellen Berlin, Irving Berlin's eldest daughter, was on the board of Juilliard, and she said, "You'd be good on the board of Juilliard. Why don't you do that?" So I was tremendously flattered and excited because my father had been on the board of Juilliard. Oh. I and know. I thought, oh, this is good. A year after, the man who was slated to be the chairman, he died. And I think they just didn't have anything else available. So they said, that was when they said, would you be uh, a chairman of the board? Well, strangest chairman anybody ever got, but they got me. And I absolutely loved it. And then, of course, there was this nice little thing that happened because they were making some changes in it, in the playwriting department. And uh, I thought of somebody I thought would be a wonderful teacher. I don't know why, because I never had her for a teacher, but I said, would you be interested in, in teaching playwriting at Juilliard? And she said, absolutely. And that was our friend here. And that's, she and Chris Durang managed to teach you without hurting you. Well, and it's owing to their generosity and their understanding themselves of what it takes to put your heart out in the middle of a rehearsal room. Well, the reason the program doesn't hurt anybody is because we are, that's, that's where we begin. We begin with like, you have the voice, you have the talent, you have everything that you need except uh, some experience in working in the world, which Juilliard, you know, d your influence, I think, at Juilliard was so great in that it created a sense that all artists are part of the same world and need to be um, aware of each other. We could go on for hours talking about the greatness. I'm curious if there are, if there are doors that you have left closed. I wish I'd studied orchestration. Ah would have made an enormous difference. I was always in the position when the orchestra was playing something of mine, I would have to run from the back of the theater down to the pit and say, there, there, it's the flute, it's the flute. But then I'd have, and it was a wrong note, obviously. Uh, my ear was perfectly good, but I would have no idea of how to fix it. Right. Uh, it was the most important thing I never did, and it's because I left Wellesley in my senior year and got married and pr had three children 
by the right. time I was 24. So you can't have everything. Right. But it would have been enormously helpful. And I think I've always felt insecure about, uh, about that aspect of my musicality, such as it is. How did you deal with the relative acceptance or non-acceptance of work? The first part of it is obviously practice. Mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not gonna write Night Mother every single time. You just can't be so anxious and sure that you're a failure that you don't do the next Night Mother. And I remember years ago, you're getting an award and speaking, I think it was NET or somebody like that. It was a little dinner for you when you were very new. And you said something I've never forgotten, which was, it's our obligation as people in the theater to see not just the hits that our friends write, but also our flops, their, their flops. Because it's interesting to you and it's encouraging to them and you can learn a great deal and we owe it to them. All you really have to do as a writer is get your body of work done. When people see things as, oh God, critics hated that one or they, I just, that was, no, when nobody would, I can't get anybody to produce that, I might as well quit. No, just as you have said, the answer is yeah. no, go on. This is a valley, the peak is coming. Yeah. <laughs> just stay on the road. Of course, I'm not an ideal person to be talking about that because I just finished telling you a while back that after I'd worked three years on the same musical and didn't get anywhere, I switched off entirely. Well, not entirely, but most people are not lucky enough to be invited to try something else. Mm -hmm. So you better keep at what you know you were good enough to get a Pulitzer Prize the first time mm -hmm. for. Does that mean I have to quit writing musicals? <laughs> <laughs> no. You do pretty well with your musicals. I do. I love them so much. I love them so much. Do I you... remember your Amish musical. Oh, my goodness. The one that couldn't get made. That's the one that nobody knows. Well, the Winter Shakers. There was no sex in it. That's true. There was no sex. Don't write musicals Don't write a sex. musical with no <laughs> sex. <laughs> what other pieces of advice do you have? Just recognize the fact that you are the luckiest person in the world next to somebody else who does the same thing, which is what my father always used to say to me, because you can get up every morning, whether you end up succeeding with that particular piece of work or not, you get up every day looking forward to the work you're doing. And when you think of the number of people who are working in car factories or who are not even working in car factories, you realize how lucky you are because everybody doesn't have those talents, those beginnings of things that could be explored. That's all. This is Adam this is that kind of show. You oh, will I see that. Oh, hi. Oh my God. This is Hello. Hello, dog. Is Dad here? I think you should come to your mother while the ca camera's rolling. Yes, pretend you like me. Hi, lady. It's not a question of pretending. A real instrument, you can Hi. actually make it seem real. Are you people interested in what my life is like? Because this is it. This, folks, is what it's like to be a mother and a composer. Then if you're interested, we can send in four more children if I can find out where they are. <laughs> and that'll be the output for this life. Mm -hmm.